Okay, good morning, everyone. And welcome to session two of, of our series, uh, exploring something, a very contemporary subject, whistleblowers and, and assorted folks who decide to tell their story in public. Um, as I said the last time, things have settled down somewhat. It is always hard to follow the Pope when you're doing any kind of you know, presentation or, or attracting attention and so forth. If you'd, I'm Peter Ernest, the executive director. Uh, let me just ask you if you'd be kind enough to turn off your electronic, your cell phones, other electronic gear. The, uh, the subject this morning, I think, will prove extraordinarily interesting. It was one of the first instances I remember of anything like this. I had just joined CIA. I'd been trained. I'd been briefed on what I was going to do. When I joined CIA, I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew nothing about operations. I knew nothing about CIA. Uh, it sounded like fun, travel, languages, and so forth. And also, I needed a job. <laughs> so it was, it was a time to join. I was uh, trained, sent to Athens, and within months, uh, Martin and Mitchell went public. And they were talking about all the things the government did that were bad. And I realized that I would be the person doing those things uh, while I was overseas. So it was an extraordinary experience for a young officer uh, to see these two folks, who weren't that old themselves. They were both near 30, uh, sort of blowing the whistle, as they thought. And of course, they had uh, sneaked their way out uh, and traveled uh, by way of Cuba unlike Snowden, but they made their way to that bastion of freedom, freedom Moscow. Uh, this seems to attract people who are looking for free speech and, and a, a place to, you know, to vent their, vent their feelings about the horrors in the United States. At any rate, I think you're going to be delighted with today's presentation. I have known uh, David Barrett, Dr. Barrett, for some time. He has been here before and presenting, and I regard his book, The CIA in Congress, which we have uh, in the back, and I imagine, David, you will have time to stay behind and sign some copies. Okay, this is a terrific book. Um, I know uh, interest in Congress varies from year to year. Uh, what Congress does seems to vary from year to year, if not every four years, and this is a terrific backgrounder to understand both Congress and its relationship to the intelligence community and the CIA specifically. So I highly recommend it. Uh, David Barrett is a, Dr. Barrett is a professor of political science at Villanova University. He spent about 10 years in broadcasting in Indiana, uh, doing public affairs interviews and involved in the political uh, situation there, eventually earned his master's in England came back to Notre Dame and got a doctorate in political science. Specializing in the U.S. presidency and foreign policy, he's authored four books, uh, two on President Johnson and the Vietnam War, and then the CIA in Congress, the book I, I just showed you, and then in 2012, Blind Over Cuba, The uh, Photo Gap and the Missile Crisis. He's, uh, he did that with, uh, with Max Holland, and he's also published widely, including the New York Times and our own Washington Post and other outlets. So, uh, David, I think one of the things that will interest us uh, as we watch Snowden spend his years in Moscow as to how Martin, Michel, uh, Martin and Mitchell ended up their years in Moscow. Did they live happily ever after? And, and, uh, what was the outcome of that? Because I think we're all very eager to see what will happen in the Snowden case, who will be the subject of our last presentation. So please help me welcome Dr. David Barrett. Just making room for my notes here. Notes are, uh, notes are pretty much a kind of a security, like a security blanket for Linus. It's, it's pretty much in my brains, but I always do a, a bit of an outline just in case. Uh, Peter, thank you. It's great to be back at the International Spy Museum. And of course, it's always great uh, to, when one is a speaker to have an actual audience uh, for that talk. 
I attended an academic conference in San Francisco five weeks ago. There it was a panel with four presenters, two discussants, and a chair. That's seven people on the panel. There were five people in the audience. <laughs> so, so it really is great um, um, to see you here. And let me just, let's see my computer. There we go. All right, so, <coughs> pardon me if I cough occasionally. It was William Martin and Bernan Mitchell, again, that first name is Bernan, uh, who first outed the National Security Agency to the world. Uh, when I, I, I came across the story of uh, Martin and Mitchell when I was doing research for my CIA and Congress book, and I actually wrote a chapter about them and then sent it off to a publisher who sent it to some reviewers. And one of the reviewers said, well, this Martin Mitchell thing is interesting, but after all, it's about NSA, not CIA, so maybe it doesn't belong in the book. And it was, it, so it's, the story is very, barely there in the book. But I, I continued to have an interest in it, and I ended up writing an article about it, uh, a couple of articles about it. Um, one of the things that I did is I looked to see how well known was NSA after all, it was only created in 1952 by President Truman by a secret executive order. So by 1960, it's been around for about eight years or so. How well known was it? And so I thought, well, we'll do a search of the congressional record to see is it ever mentioned, the existence of NSA. Uh, not at all until finally, in, well, in 1959, there was a bill that got very little attention that did a bit of treatment of uh, changing the law in relation to NSA. So no mention at all across the 1950s on the floors of the, the House and the Senate until briefly uh, in 1959. Really nothing in 60 until this Martin and Mitchell um, event. I also looked at the New York Times and again, and the Washington Post, like the, 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 just, it, there's a reason why people joke that NSA stood for no such agency, because there was really, there was just no publicity about NSA until these two uh, young men uh, defected from the U.S. Um, the photo that you see here is uh, Martin and Mitchell, and then over to the right is one of the translators who were with them. But before I talk about this press conference, that a very well-attended press conference in 1960, let me talk about their backgrounds. They were both, uh, they were unusual as, um, as children, um, which, which is not a bad thing. I think I was an unusual child as well. <laughs> You know, I was a bit of a geek and I was interested in history. They were geeks who were interested in math. Uh, they were sort of both socially awkward, both had an interest in music, both very opinionated and in, in the view of, of sort of their peers, arrogant. Uh, their parents, uh, mind you, they didn't know each other in childhood. One was growing up, one, uh, uh, William, who was known as Ham, Martin was from, had. Georgia background, but although there, his family moved to the Northwest. Uh, Bernan Mitchell grew up in the San Francisco area. They, they would meet in the 1950s, early 50s in the Navy, but very similar childhoods. Their parents did not know what to make of them. There was one day, let's see, I think this was, um, uh, this was William Martin. He, I think he was nine years old and he, he said to his mother, sort of out of the blue, um, you know, Galileo was right with that. And then he mentioned some theory or something. His mother's like, okay, thank you. So uh, unusual, very interested in math. Um, they both joined the Navy. They met in Japan. They were both doing some kind of secret cryptological work for uh, the Navy. They had had certain, of course, clearance uh, procedures that they went through in order to do their work for the Navy. Uh, after the Navy, they came back to the U.S. Both were doing some college work. They were both, they, they stayed in touch. They were, they continued to be friends. They were both hired by NSA in 1958, 59. Uh, they were doing uh, cryptological work. 
I've never seen extreme detailed treatment of what they did, but it was, it was highly specialized and highly secretive work. So I can't tell you very much about that, but it was work of some real importance, I would say. One of them, well, they lived in Laurel, Maryland. One lived in a rented home. The other lived in a motel, a motel room that was a couple of uh, blocks away. In the time that they were working at National Security Agency, this is a close-up, more close-up photo of uh, Mitchell, apparently. In that fairly brief time that they were at NSA, you know, they read newspapers, they, they learned a lot on their work at NSA. They learned, for example, that the U.S. had been sending aircraft sort of close to or sometimes actually over Soviet uh, airspace. There was, a, there was an incident where the Soviets shot down a U.S. aircraft in 1958, and they could see, they, were, they knew enough from the work at NSA, and I suppose sort of the, you know, sort of the, you know, the talk that went around at NSA to know that what the, what the government said about that flight, denying that in any way it was a spy sort of a flight, was not true. They, they again, they were, they were, I would say they were young, they were arrogant, they were uh, idealistic in their own way, very much so. They became convinced that U.S. foreign policy was actually endangering world peace. Meanwhile, they developed a different view of the Soviet Union. Their view of the Soviet Union seemed not to be shaped by U.S. news media reporting, but they, instead they took an interest, I mean, I'm sure they, re I know they read U.S. newspapers, but they uh, subscribed, there were some Soviet publications that were becoming available because the U.S., there were some measures of U.S. and Soviet open each other, the other, uh, sort of news media kinds of reports. So it was a magazine, one of the magazines that's all referenced was literally called USSR. So produced by s some agency of the Soviet government, made available here in English language. They became convinced that the Soviet Union had a foreign policy that was not particularly, quote, dangerous to world peace, but that, the, that there was this very dramatic contrast. For example, they noticed how did President Eisenhower describe what the U.S. was doing in the world, and then what was the reality that they thought they saw through a combination of their work at NSA, some things they read in U.S. news media, and what they read in, in magazines produced out of the Soviet Union. They decided to go, now I'm going to apologize here, I, uh, there, that's the one I'm, I meant actually to bring up. For yesterday morning, I was going to do a PowerPoint, and then I thought, oh, I'm just showing a few slides, so I'll just do some Google images, and well, now I've got 10 things to show you. They went to this man. You remember the name Wayne Hayes, Representative Congressman Wayne Hayes, who would become infamous, I think, somewhere that would have been in the 1970s or so, because by then chairing a committee, and there was a, a woman that he hired to be in the committee staff, and it seems, as, as she would say to the press, well, basically I was hired because I was his mistress. So he became famous to the American public then, but I, I'm talking Wayne Hayes as a more junior member of the House of Representatives. When that aircraft, that U.S. aircraft that was shot down over the Soviet Union, the U.S. government said, well, it's just, you know, it's just, it's all a big mistake. It's not a spy aircraft. And, and the U.S. was sort of criticizing the Soviet Union. The Soviets were saying, no, it's a spy flight. Hayes, Wayne Hayes of Ohio, on the floor of the House, gave some suggestion that the U.S. government was lying. This caught the interest of uh, Martin and Mitchell. They decided, so, th so they wanted to fix, they wanted the U.S. government to tell the truth. They wanted to fix uh, U.S. foreign policy, so they thought, well, they go to Wayne Hayes. Wayne Hayes, by the way, he, yeah, he was on the House Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs Committee, but he had really nothing to do with oversight of CIA, much less NSA. I mean, it, you know, you, I think you all, many of you know this. I mean, CIA was a very, an organization surrounded by a lot of secrecy, but there was like hyper secrecy surrounding NSA. So Wayne Hayes, you know, uh, he, so he received the two men in his office. He didn't clearly understand where they were from. He actually thought they worked at CIA. He didn't even get that part 
straight. They started to tell him what they knew or thought they knew about what NSA and the, and the larger intelligence establishment was doing. By chance, a phone call came in to Representative Hayes. It was from the congressional liaison person for the State Department asking him if he would try to, to sort of not say anything for a while about that aircraft that was shot down over the Soviet Union fairly recently. And so he thought, they know that I'm talking to these two? Am, am I being tested here? So he thanked them for the information they gave. He actually did pass it on, apparently, to the, ch to the chair, Thomas Morgan, of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and then that was it. And so really, from the vantage point of Martin and Mitchell, nothing came of this approach to Congress. Uh, so nothing came of it. In, at, toward the very end of 1959, they, they did a trip, they didn't tell NSA, they, they actually uh, went to Mexico and Cuba in 1959. In this time frame, they decided that they were going to defect. So then you jump ahead to 1960, and it would have been in June, they told NSA that they were both traveling together out west to visit their family members. They didn't come back from vacation after a few weeks. Obviously, their employer, NSA, is wondering where they are. Uh, they, they get a, a, some kind of a warrant to go into the apartment of, or, or the room of one of these fellows, and they find a sa safety deposit box for a bank. They go there. NSA uh, goes there. They open the safety deposit box. There is a statement which basically says, I'm paraphrasing, we would like to inform our family and friends and fellow citizens why we have decided to defect. So at that point, NSA learns uh, that these two men have uh, defected. In fact, so what they did is they, uh, they flew to Mexico City, uh, they went from Mexico City to Havana, and then apparently by boat they left Havana and then ultimately made their way to the Soviet Union and Moscow. Details about that are rather um, obscure. So, here in this country, at first, the Defense Department issued a very bland press release saying that two junior-level mathematicians, that was the phrase, two junior-level mathematicians seem to have gone behind, have disappeared, seem to have gone behind the Iron Curtain. They could, this news release said, they could in no way do any harm to the interests of the United States or its security. So this sort of this very bland statement. Uh, two, two things happened, though. Some high-ranking, let me see if I can find John. I apologize that I, I know I should have done these in the correct order. There we go. John McCormick. Now, this is a picture from the more the mid-60s or so. But in 1960, John McCormick, he was not yet Speaker of the House. He was the House Majority Leader. Uh, and he'd always taken, an, I don't think he really knew anything about NSA, but he'd always taken an interest in CIA and was a real supporter of CIA. Well, anyway, some, I don't know the name of this person, but some fairly high-ranking intelligence official went to John McCormick in his office and told him uh, the Defense Department is not being honest about what has happened. These, these two young men, they know a lot of secrets. They can do a lot of damage to NSA and to, you know, U.S. national security and all of that. McCormick was persuaded of that, and then he did something very, very uncharacteristic. This is, McCormick was not a, a huge speech maker. He was a big, he was a power in the House, but he's not, you know, some, some members of Congress, this is still true, they just like to give a lot of speeches, even if no one's there particularly to listen. <laughs> These days, there's at least C-SPAN in that era, you know, there wasn't, but McCormick went to the floor and, and, and he said, you know, the Defense Department, this is, this is so uncharacteristic of McCormick. He said the Defense Department's just not being honest here. I've been told that these two uh, men, you know, they knew big secrets and, and this has done real damage. So there's that. And then there's the press conference. Not too long after NSA issues or Defense Department issues this bland press release, suddenly there is the uh, press conference that I showed you the photo from. Um, let me see if I can find a, I have, um, there we go. 
I went on YouTube to see what do we have of Martin and Mitchell. We have one, what seems to be a Soviet newsreel. So you're going to hear someone speaking, you're going to hear loud sort of patriotic music. Uh, we're not going to, I'm, so. This is just YouTube. Um, and that's a, a news photograph as well. So the news conference was well attended by, by news media from around the world. While that original news release from the Defense Department got very little play, you know, two young junior level mathematicians, you know, not such a big deal. But this press conference was an absolutely huge story. Page one in any number of uh, newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, and all the rest. Um, the, 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 the New York Times printed, they didn't print everything, but they printed most of the, so the press conference, they were, the, the two men were introduced by a Soviet uh, sort of foreign, uh, or a press ministry person, and then they also took questions. So uh, they, they talked about the number of people at NSA, they, they gave an estimate of the budget for, for NSA. I think they also did, the, they mentioned CIA budget, if I recall correctly. They said, you know, NSA, working on behalf of the U.S. government, is, is monitoring. They actually said something like, We're monitoring the communications of like 40-something countries. Uh, they said that NSA was, was monitoring not only communications of rivals and enemies, but some allies. They, uh, I recall they mentioned, and, France and Italy. They told a story of NSA getting involved in some sort of a break-in into an embassy of an ally. After some questioning, they said the ally was Turkey. So some kind of a break-in to steal some kind of secret codes from that embassy here in Washington, D.C. So um, they, they said US, the U.S. is a danger to world peace. Uh, some, some reporters said, well, but you're in the Soviet Union, but what about the Soviet Union? Are, 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 are there, if, aren't, aren't they too most likely engaging in similar kinds of espionage, technical, human, whatever, sort of various kinds of unsavory behaviors? And Martin and Mitchell said, the, to our view, the Soviets do not engage in analogous behavior. Those are the exact words. The Soviets do not engage in analogous behavior. They, they spoke very favorably of the Soviet Union. Uh, the news reporting in the U.S. had been implying that the two men were, were gay, were homosexual. Uh, I don't recall that that specific question came up in the press conference, but one of the things that they spent some time sort of complimenting the Soviet government and Soviet society on was the role and the status of women in the Soviet Union and, and, and frankly said the Soviet Union, uh, much in contrast to the U.S., the Soviet Union is a place where women can do and can achieve great things where their talents are fully appreciated in a way that's, that's not true of the U.S. So this was just a an absolutely huge story in the U.S. and, and around the world that NSA uh, was written about extensively, and this has simply never happened before, and it was because um, of these two men. So how, let me say some more about the response in the U.S. Um, and by the way, it's my plan to try to save about 25 or 30 minutes for you all to ask me questions. So here in the U.S., how, how, how was the response? President Eisenhower described them as self-confessed traitors. That's the exact wording, self-confessed traitors. Former President Truman, you know, he's, when you're out of the presidency, you can really say what you think. He said, they ought to be shot. <laughs> and then he said something about Sodom and Gomorrah. I forget what, but something, because it was, again, the suggestions um, that, that they were homosexual. Um, I've told you about John McCormick. 
Um, again, the news media, so let me talk about, I'll talk about um, Francis Walter. There he is. And now there's a picture a, few, a couple years after this event. Representative Francis Walter, Democrat of Pennsylvania, a district, I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia, so he's, he was from a district about an hour north of where I currently live. The House Committee on uh, Un-American Activities. Uh, he had been a member back to the 1930s. This was, of course, an infamous committee, sort of, it in, you, I think you all have heard of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. It had a kind of a McCarthyite reputation. Uh, he had become the chair in the 1950s. So, uh, one of the things that John McCormick did was to reach out to Francis Walter. McCormick was aware that the Armed Services Committee under Carl Vinson, the chair from Georgia, that they, there was going to be some kind of investigation into this NSA and this defection. And McCormick really thought it was going to be something like a whitewash. So he reached out instead to Francis Walter, who by then was chairing Un-American Activities Committee, and urged him to do an investigation. There was a, in a journal article I published that I described in some detail, the wrangling amongst Walter and Carl Vinson and John McCormick, and the speaker would have been involved. And it, it got settled so that both investigations would happen, NSA. NSA at first just would not cooperation, cooperate with Francis Walter's committee. NSA was cooperating with the House Armed Services. Uh, Carl Vince had appointed a subcommittee to investigate this, and so there was cooperation from NSA. Uh, when Un-American Activities Committee staffers showed up one day at NSA at the gate, at the entrance, they were just not allowed in, so there was just a kind of a, a breakdown between them. But meanwhile, Francis Walter was speaking to the press, and, he's, and he said, clearly the security procedures at NSA are deficient, and clearly it is riddled with homosexuals. He, he made these sort of repeated references to, well, he used the word deviates, uh, he, sometimes he sounded somewhat more charitable. He would refer to Martin Mitchell as these poor, unfortunate homosexuals. Um, now, the context for Francis Walter taking this goes back to a, a, a congressional committee, although this was on the Senate side. There was a special investigative, uh, uh, there was a subcommittee that was uh, um, looked into, I mean, you see the, if you, I don't know if you can read this, this is from the early 1950s. Employment of homosexuals and other sex perverts in government. Wow. I, I came across this report when I was working on CIA in Congress, and I wrote in CIA Congress about, about sexual orientation and CIA, and, and there were some real, there was real, some real crusades going on in Congress to, to root out homosexuals and to fire them from government service. And so Francis Walter, even before he was eventually receiving cooperation from NSA, he was convinced, like, this is, the, this is the big problem there. The problem is these two guys are homosexual, and there's just something about homosexuals. I, mean, I was really fascinated. When I was looking at the congressional record in the, a few years uh, before the NSA event, there would these, be these conversations like, well, what is it about the homosexuals that lead them to become traitors? And why are they so much more likely to be communists than, than heterosexuals? So it's a really, it's really sort of a, sort of a stunning thing. But Francis Walter, he had already seen a copy of this report, but John McClellan of the Senate sent him a copy of this report to sort of remind him of what was in it. Um, eventually, well, there was, there was the 1960 election. By the way, this was not a big issue in the 1960 presidential election. Kennedy and Nixon didn't talk about it much. So in contrast, you know, the U-2 incident was something that was talked about somewhat in the 1960 election, but not so much um, uh, this event. Um, with the new presidency of John F. Kennedy, who's a Democrat, that was a factor that really led to Defense Department, NSA, basically being told, you know, you've got to work with Francis Walter. He's, he's a leading Democrat. Yes, he, he sort of goes off on these tangents sometimes. He's a bit of an unguided missile. That was his reputation in the House. He had once been thought, Francis Walter had once been thought to be, uh, and I have a photo of Francis Walter here. Yeah, there he is. Um, 
someone who might become Speaker of the House, and along the way people decided, no, no, this guy is not suited to be Speaker of the House. But, but Kennedy and McNamara told Defense Department, NSA, you know, you, you've got to cooperate. So the House and American Committee Activities Committee did an extensive investigation, which then stretched into 1961. Uh, uh, they issued a very, they took testimony, they did a very significant report, they severely criticized NSA for its lack of security practices. Uh, I think arguably in some ways the, the committee investigation report were irresponsible. There was this, again, this fixation on homosexuality. Um, but they also, they, they, what they showed is the security clearance procedures that NSA like officially employed were not in fact fully carried out before these two guys started working at NSA. That is, basically NSA relied on security uh, clearances and security sort of procedures that had been done earlier when these two guys had been brought into the Navy and were doing cryptological work there. So uh, a check with all the agencies of the government to see if there were any adverse sort of information about them and, and the polygraphs. So they had passed the polygraphs some years before. But the work that NSA was supposed to do to clear these two men uh, before they were brought in was in fact not done. So it seems to me that was a significant finding of Un-American Activities Committee. And again, the, the report from the House Armed Services Committee was much less substantial. Um, in the aftermath of the Un-American Activities Committee report and sort of pressing NSA, NSA shifted gears in terms of how it regarded homosexuals. The, 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 the previous policy, by today's standards, will look rather enlightened, which is to say this was not something for which you were simply fired. If NSA judged that you were, you know, if you're a stable, sane, patriotic sort of human being, then, then the, the policy was, well, we're, we're not going to automatically fire you because there's an indication uh, that you're homosexual. But pressed by Francis Walter's committee, they changed the policy again. In the first year or so uh, after, um, or even before Un-American Activities issued its committee, NSA, uh, by its own accounting, found and dismissed, fired 24 people uh, from National Security Agency. Um, I actually, I don't know for sure. The truth is when I read all this stuff about them, I thought, well, it sounds like they were probably, I mean, I think bisexual, but, but uh, you know, the, the evidence isn't very strong. One of these two men had told a site, uh, when, when he was being interviewed for NSA, he had told some, someone questioning him, I think a doctor, had said that he had, had some, engaged in some homosexual activity in his early life. The, the other one told NSA that he, that he had never been homosexual, although when he spoke to a psychiatrist on his own, he did admit to being, uh, having been bisexual in some parts of his life. So whether these two men were sexual partners, I don't know. Uh, Certainly after they got to the Soviet Union when they would occasionally talk to Americans who were visiting, in 1962 they spoke to a visiting New York Times reporter, or, or one of them did, I forget which, I think it was Martin, but it might have been Mitchell. Anyway, he said, like, we, we are not homosexual, we've never been homosexual. So I don't, the truth is, I don't know the truth of that. Um, but. You know, I've, I've read what there is to be read about this subject matter. James Bamford, in his books on NSA, wrote something about this. And he said, and I agree, he said, you know, sexual orientation isn't, wasn't, there's just no evidence that that was a sort of a important or in any way determining factor of why these two men defected and why they outed National Security Agency to the world. It has to do with, with ideology. They had, and it's, I think it was a sort of bizarre, naive ideology, this conviction that the U.S. was uniquely doing bad things in world politics, and this naive conviction that the Soviet Union was not. Now, I will say, when I read what they said about what the U.S. was doing, Look, they, they, they were describing some things accurately, and I think it's fair to say, look, these are some unpalatable things, but okay, if anyone knows anything about intelligence. I mean, as Eisenhower himself said in the aftermath of the U-2 incident when President Eisenhower finally held a press conference, he made a statement, and he said, yes, this, the U-2 aircraft was ours, and 
in some way he indicated that he had authorized these, uh, the U2 program. And he said, these things, he said, they're distasteful. It's, it's, it's a great shame that we have to do such things. They're distasteful. But Eisenhower said, they're necessary. Distasteful, but necessary. Um, so what about their lives in the Soviet Union? They both married, both married women. Uh, both, to my knowledge, one for sure was divorced. I think it was William Martin. He was divorced within a couple of years, I believe. Uh, Bernard Mitchell was also subsequently divorced. They were very unhappy in the Soviet Union. They would occasionally, uh, and, and uh, by the way, I'll just say, their friendship more or less ended after the first year or so. They did not stay frequently in touch, only periodically in touch. But both unhappy, uh, both drank, I mean, both developed very significant drinking problems. Uh, they would approach Americans. One of them approached, so there was this New York Times reporter in 1962, and the Times published a big story where, um, I think it was Martin, I, I, have to, I have to make a confession here. Martin and Mitchell, they, this, this photo doesn't make that clear, but, um, oh, that's a, one more. To me, although one guy has the glasses here, uh, I guess it's M Mitchell wearing the glasses, but a lot of times, like in photographs, I can't tell which one is which, and it used to sort of bother me, like, come on, David, get it together. It's Martin and it's Mitchell, and you need to be able to tell them apart in photos. And then I read, so they did some graduate work, or some coursework at George Washington University while they were here in, in this area working at NSA, and one of the professors said, I could never tell them apart. They looked alike. They sort of they had these sort of similar personalities. One of them was supposedly more effeminate. One was supposed to be effeminate, not the other, but but they were thought to look alike. So anyway, uh, one of them told the reporter that they had been naive about the Soviet Union. Life in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was no worker's paradise. Uh, they they had been. They never seemed to take back their views of the U.S., but they developed different views of the Soviet Union because they lived there. They felt that they were not, although they were given some kind of mathematical work, they were not given what they regarded as significant high-level kind of work. They were not happy with their work lives. They were not happily married. They both drank. They both gave indications that they, they would they would like to come back to the U.S., but they understood that was a non-starter. That sure, they actually said in more than one occasion to visitors, they expressed the view that if they did come back to the U.S., they would be assassinated by intelligence agents. Sometimes they just said, "Well, obviously we would we would have to go to prison," so they uh, did not want to do that. For years afterward, uh, there was some continuing but slowly dying out government attention to to these two men. Uh, I found a document, it's someone at NSA talking to the deputy director of NSA in 1964, uh, actually for a lot of years, Louis Tordella, who's a really a key figure. I mean, the directors at NSA were coming and going, but this deputy director was in place for a couple of decades. Tordella was convinced, or, or was, was very fearful in 1964, that there was still someone at NSA who had helped Martin and Mitchell. His belief about this was largely, you, you know, I mentioned to you that they left a statement in the, the safety security box uh, at, 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 a, at a local bank, which NSA uh, investigators found. Tordella said that statement was very well written. And he said neither of these guys was a good writer, but it was very well written. And he said the typing of the statement was immaculate, and neither of these guys was any good at typing. So. How did the statement get produced? This convinced him, or made him at least fearful. But I've seen no indication that the NSA ever found anyone who, who there who had assisted them. Jump ahead to the 1970s. I think at a point where even we're into the beginning of the Carter era, and the father of uh, Martin or Mitchell reached out to the Justice Department to say, if my son were to be allowed by the Soviets to leave, and if he were to come back, would he be indicted? And he actually got a, a sort of a vague response. The, the, the response did not say, yes, we'll arrest 
your son and charge him with these crimes. It was kind of a kind of a vague response, but obviously nothing came um, of that. Oh, I wanted to tell you the uh, let's see the Benny Goodman story. Let's see. I apologize for he's in here somewhere. That's not it. Well, I seem to have lost Benny Goodman. Um, it's okay. So one day, Benny Goodman, uh, well, Benny Goodman traveled to the Soviet Union. You know, remember the State Department used to sort of sponsor these sort of cultural exchanges and all of that? And there's even, I, I was looking at this up last night, there's at least one, and I think actually two different albums of live performances, Buddy, Benny Goodman and, and his, his band, I don't know the name of his band in that era, but in any case, Buddy, Benny Goodman uh, performing in the Soviet Union. There, there, there's a record album that can still, you know, on eBay or something, can, can probably be purchased. So uh, one day, uh, Benny Goodman is out walking, um, somewhere, and it's in Leningrad. Uh, and Martin and Mitchell would oftentimes just go over, if they would hear an American accent, they'd just go over and introduce themselves. And Benny Goodman was walking with some State Department sort of person accompanying him on this walk. And um, I think that this was Mitchell. Uh, and so, you know, they start chatting, and, and, uh, and the American, Mitchell, didn't know didn't, didn't know that this was, you know, the great Benny, or the famous Benny Goodman. So Benny Goodman basically says, well, I'm, I'm the jazz musician. I'm Benny Goodman. And Mitchell says, oh, gee, I'm sorry. I, I just don't happen to like your music. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> um, so they stayed on. Now there is this, um, there's a story. So Mitchell apparently died in 1991 in the Soviet Union. Um, there, are, there was a news report published a few years ago. I don't think it was very well sourced, but it may have been based on, on some document from NSA. There's at least a rumor that was then reported in a, in a sort of an alternative news magazine a few years ago uh, that says that William Martin actually left Russia. There's also, there's an unconfirmed, I actually did find an unconfirmed report that NSA looked at that he'd gotten out of the Soviet Union in the late 70s. I mean, I don't know. I just don't know the truth of these things. But there's more substantial reporting that he left in, in the post-Soviet era, uh, made his way uh, from Russia, ended up in Mexico, living in Mexico, and dying in a hospital in Tijuana, and being secretly buried in the U.S. So this story is out there about, about him, and I just don't, uh, I, I'm actually doubtful of it, but it, it could be true. I just don't know. So what about the, what do I think about these two men, and what do I think about these two men in, in uh, comparison to Edward Snowden? I will say when the, Snowdens, when the Snowden story broke, I immediately did think about Martin and Mitchell, and, what I, and I've, I've never sort of stopped thinking about this, about what they have in common. Young, male, of, of course, doing work, for NSA, although these two guys are sort of full-time, you know, employees uh, of, of NSA. But young, male, technologically adept, in my view, this is the comparison, and you all can agree or disagree, but just terribly naive, terribly naive. Even, and even though they were doing technological work as part of the U.S. intelligence establishment, I, I don't think, this is my view, I don't think there was a sophisticated understanding of intelligence in sort of the larger context of, of, of world politics and what, what goes on in world politics and the sorts of activities that nation states uh, engage in. So I think that they, these two men were naive, I, 
they were arrogant. I mean, there's so many people. I've read so many reports. What did people think these two men were like in their young years, and what were they like when they were working at NSA? And, and words like arrogant uh, just, just, just repeatedly came up. Um, they, like Snowden, were so deeply convinced that the U.S. was uniquely dangerous and, and uniquely, that U.S. foreign policy was uniquely hypocritical. Um, so I, I, I think that there are some real sort of similarities between them and Snowden. Um, now one difference is this story, the Martin and Mitchell story, I think reporters, my sister's a reporter, she would say, this is a story that did not have legs, which is to say the American news media made a big deal about this press conference, and then the story, the whole Martin and Mitchell thing just kind of faded from public interest. I mean, I think if you'd surveyed Americans in, say, 1962, a couple of years later, and say, so who, who are Bernard Mitchell and William Martin? I, 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 this is just not a story that seemed to have a lot of life beyond this event. And I, I attribute that to, to the... Uh, when I looked for indications of sympathy for Martin and Mitchell in the U.S., I mean, I just don't find sympathetic responses to Martin and Mitchell in the U.S. I, I just, I looked. I just couldn't, there, there probably were some somewhere, but, but I didn't find that. So that's a real difference, obviously. The, the Snowden story is, is still just this ongoing um, big story, and there obviously is in the United States uh, a good deal of respect and sympathy. There are people in this country who think that Snowden is, is a hero. That's not my view. Uh, but so there, that is, is a difference. So I know that the title of this series has the war of this week-to-week -week series here at the Spy Museum, Whistleblowers or Leakers or Traitors. With regard to M Martin and Mitchell, I'm not, I don't think whistleblower captures it. I don't think leaking captures it. So I'll go with traders. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think uh, David is prepared to take questions. Let me just wait for the microphone so everyone can hear the question. Thank you. Okay. There's one right down here. Question. Yes, right there. <coughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. It, it's not clear to me what what exactly uh, how, how, did they harm the country? I mean, there, there was uh, sort of a bad image that came out of it. But in, in what way was there a compromise of the NSA or its programs uh, by these two? You know, most of the what I've been able to look at declassified government documents, including, you all might recall that in the early 1990s, the, the, the U.S. Congress passed this JFK Assassination Records Act, which sort of really pushed agencies to declassify a lot more documents that might even be tangentially related to the JFK assassination, that whole story. Well, so, for whatever reason, some, some Martin and Mitchell documents were declassified then, so I saw some. The truth is, in, in the longer run, uh, NSA itself didn't seem, or at least the people writing histories at NSA, did not seem to find that grave damage had been done to NSA itself. So, as, and, and I, you know, I just, I can tell you what I see in the documents, I wouldn't be able to judge it beyond that, but I, so I have the impression that what they did did not create any sort of severe, long-lasting damage to NSA itself. So I would say damage done, well, you know, arguably you know, the, the image of the U.S. around the world was damaged. Uh, but, you know, I also think, you know, these, these were stories that were going to come out eventually anyway. It just happened to be it was these two men who, who did it. So damage to the U.S. image and raising, you know, raising the question of hypocrisy uh, on the part of the U.S. government. Again, I mean, I don't think I'm naive about this stuff. Governments are not going to be forthcoming with the news media and the public about a lot of the intelligence activities. So, yeah, there's, I guess you could call that hypocrisy, but it's predictable 
hypocrisy. The, 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 the contrast between what national leaders say, which is usually very idealistic sounding, and what their governments sometimes do in their intelligence activities. So that's the only real damage that I can see based on what I read in declassified documents, that, that not a lot of harm actually was done, though, to NSA itself. Over there? Yes. Well, it seemed to me that a better comparison uh, than with Snowden would be with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who has, before he goes to the Soviet Union, a very naive view of, uh, of, this, uh, of the Soviet Union. He goes, uh, he goes there, they, the Soviets give him a minor, uh, a minor job. Uh, he, gets a, he gets a Russian wife, and, uh, and he's, dis, he's, he's, he's disillusioned and comes back. That's, my comment, but yeah. my, my question is the, um, uh, the note in the uh, safe deposit box. Right. Did, do you think they were just playing games with the, uh, uh, with the NSA and the, U and the US government, you know, find, uh, find me if you can, and, or did they intend this letter at some point or to, to be mailed, at, mailed yeah. in or published uh, by a newspaper or something? Yes, I could have said more about that. What, um, what one of them did was to leave a key where it was clear that this was a key to a safety de deposit box at a nearby bank. So it, they, and, and I know from what they subsequently said, they intended NSA to find the key, to go to the bank, to find the statement. They, again, naively thought that NSA would then actually publish their entire statement, which did not happen. So when they gave the press conference, one of the things that they did was they read the entire statement. And again, that is printed in the New York Times and elsewhere. So they, they expected this statement. They, they assumed, and it turns out correctly, that they would have time to get out of the US and get themselves on the way to Moscow before that would happen. That is, NSA, I think they were supposed to, I think they were on a, like a three week vacation period, so they had time to make that happen. So in that sense, it worked out as they intended. Yes, right here, Amanda. Thank you. Sir, please wait. <clears throat> we, we, it seems to me we have two junior NSA officers who decided to defect, who have been critical of the NSA or the United States, who may or may not be homosexual. What are some of the examples that, of their criticism at the press conference? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Their criticisms of, of, of the, the United US. States, the NSA, or some examples of what they said. Uh, right. Well, so they, they talked about the U.S. Again, un until this press conference, the America, American public didn't really know there was a national security agency. So they said there's this huge agency, and I think they gave a number of like 10 or 15,000 employees, and they gave a, a huge number for the budget. And they said, National Security Agency is monitoring, it's decoding, it's listening into communications of other countries. They actually gave a number of 40-something countries, which I always wonder if, if, I guess that's the accurate number. I don't know what the accurate number would have been. But to say that, we were, that the U.S. was listening to the communications of other countries, and this is what bothered them. If, it was, if, they, if they were saying, well, it was just the U.S. You know, monitoring the Soviet Union and China, but they said, the NSA and the U.S. government is listening in on the communications of friendly countries, and they named, a, for example, a couple of NATO allies. So this is, you know, this is pretty startling information. Oh, they also talked about, I didn't mention this earlier, that the, that the U.S. government, they did not say NSA, and I don't know how they knew about this, uh, but they, they reported something that the church committee would later sort of reveal in more detail, which is the opening of mail uh, to and from America, uh, mail coming in and out of the U.S., but to, to a U.S. address. They revealed that a huge number of letters had been opened by the U.S. government. They don't say how they know that, and I don't know how they knew that. They told a story of a break-in that, that I mentioned earlier, the break-in of the embassy here. Um, those are the things that they, and then it's just kind of a general description of NSA and its size and all that. Those are the things that I recall, the ones that stick in, in my brain. Uh, and it certainly was considered shocking to the American news media at the time. There, there probably are some other things that they said that I'm not recalling here, but those were the sort of the most, considered to be the most shocking things. So the key to your presentation, as much as anything, is to look at this through 1960 eyes. Oh could yeah, I mean, this was shocking David, in 19... Could you repeat 
what he said, so we have it for the recording. So sort of the, the, I believe what you've said is sort of the, the a key sort of theme of my presentation is looking at this through 1960 eyes. And absolutely, in 1960, this was deeply shocking, which is why the New York Times, there are sort of two or three inside pages of the New York Times that are simply filled with what these men said. Uh, so absolutely looking at it through the eyes of night. And, you know, from, in the, from our vantage point today, you know, we, we all know this about it. Today, my student, I teach a course called U.S. Intelligence, and it used to be when I taught the course, students had heard, the undergrads, they had heard of one spy agency, one intelligence agency of the U.S., the CIA. Now they've heard of two, NSA, and that's, you know, the Snowden effect, I would say. Okay, right here, madam. Uh, think, thinking back uh, to, in, into the 60s, uh, it seems to me awfully naive in the midst of a Cold War where both parties have bombs that can destroy the other. For if anyone was asked the question, do you think they would be spying uh, and, uh, on each other? Well, the answer would have to be, of course there is. I mean, yeah. we came out of the, the Second World War where it was uh, codes were being broken and there were all sorts of uh, spying going on. Yes. And to think it wouldn't happen when the Cold War occurred seems to me awfully naive, well, beyond naive. <laughs> I agree. Astoundingly naive, I agree. I mean, I think these two men were astoundingly naive and arrogant. Even the public to, to respond, the public to, respond to, oh my goodness, there's a national security agency that's doing spying. Well, let me actually, let me say one more thing about the public response. So there, there was a news media response, short term, a very, very extensive coverage of this. The public's response, though, was not very substantial. One of the ways that I try to get at public responses, and I didn't find any polling, public opinion polling about this, because that's handy. But when I went through the papers, it was a Congressman Kilday, he, from Texas, he chaired the subcommittee of House Armed Services Committee that did their investigation. I went through his papers, I went through Francis Walter's papers in Pennsylvania. Uh, there was very little mail about this. Now, I will, I will say, Kilday got one letter, well, you can't even call it a letter, he, got, he received a piece of paper where one word was written on that piece of paper about Kilday's investigation of NSA, and that one word was whitewash, which is, was not entirely uh, inaccurate. But yeah, there was not a huge public outcry about this issue. There was not. Right over here. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the father checking with the government later, later on as to whether his son would be indicted if he right. were to return, and the somewhat ambiguous <clears throat> yes. response he got. I'm extrapolating that. Does, could that mean that somewhere down the line that kind of response is going to be put on Snowden coming back? I mean, to me, it should have been a, a cut and dry yes. He will be indicted. Right. So, so about 16 or 17 years had passed. I was a little surprised at that vague response that uh, the father of Martin or Mitchell received. Mm. I wouldn't think with Snowden, I think even the passage of 16 or 17 years, that there would be such a bland response. I did see there was a news report yesterday. It seemed to me it really wasn't particular news. I'm not sure that Snowden has said anything different. He has, he has repeated that, yes, on the whole, he would like to come back to the US, but then he sets these conditions under which he would come back. Uh, so. He also, I think, claimed in that report that he has made overtures to the U.S. government about negotiating a return, but has heard nothing. Right. He said he had not yeah. heard back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was another memory of 1960, and that was Henry Cabot Lodge as ambassador to the U.N., holding up a great seal of the United States, which ostensibly had been a gift from Soviet school children only to... Uh, for the U.S. Embassy, only who had embassy officials find, find that was impregnated with listening devices. And he uh, at least seemed horrified or feigned horror and pre presented this before the U.N. General Assembly. Yes. Yeah. Which, uh, as I'm sure you know, there's a replica of that in the museum. 
And it was, it was an extraordinary device because we had never seen anything like it. Uh, there were no batteries, uh, no amplifier. In other words, it was called the thing. And because it was, a, it was a new device, it was a resonator cavity and could be activated by an outside force, like a laser or something like that. And we had never seen anything like that. I think it was in Harriman's office for something like six years. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, questions for David. An interesting era, all the way over there. Okay, hold on, we'll get you a mic. Um, could you explore the impact of what I remember is a tremendous anti-communist -com sentiment in the 60s, at least I got it and uh, how that impacted on the U.S. and maybe how that compares to now. Well, I, I'm, I'm with you. I remember, well, I remember 1960. I remember, I remember Sputnik very well. My students, were, I think they're horrified when I say I remember Sputnik and tell them about <laughs> seeing it, but I do. It was when I was in, in first grade. I mean, I think that gets back to the lack of sympathetic response to what Martin and Mitchell did. Again, I mean, I'm sure if I looked really, if I looked further and looked really hard at some very far to the left publications, I might find some kind of sympathetic response. But I mean, I did a lot of looking and I just don't find the sympathetic response because in this country, as you say, anti-communism was, was pervasive and it seems to me understandably so. We're in this Cold War situation where both superpowers had the growing ability uh, to just destroy one another and, and very adverse kinds of, of ideologies. So uh, absolutely pervasive anti-communism, absolutely. And I, and I think for those of us of a certain age, like, you know, we, we get that because we lived through it. One of my challenges as a professor is, is to convey it to undergraduates who don't remember the Reagan presidency. They were born after the Reagan presidency. <laughs> All right, wait over there, Amanda. In 1960, what was the definitions for whistleblower and tra a trader and leakers compared to right now? Yeah. I don't actually know if the term whistleblower had been had become a common phrase as of 1960. Uh, certainly, leaks or leakers was was a very uh, sort of common phrase and presidents, I've researched especially presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. And I love it when I can see transcripts of their phone calls or detailed notes of their conversations. I'll give you a response by way of the presidency to leakers. Presidents were obsessed with leaks. Uh, not, I wouldn't say Eisenhower quite as much as, as, the, as the others. Kennedy was far more obsessed, I think, than Eisenhower with leaks, but all presidents. So leaking or leakers was a kind of a very, a very common phrase. Uh, I did not, I, I never saw the word whistleblower in this era, 1960, 61. I never saw the, I don't know that the, the phrase existed, whistleblower. I never saw them though described as having leaked or I never saw them described as leakers. I routinely in editorials and in sort of things said by members of Congress and, and, and political leaders, Eisenhower, Truman, Routinely, the word traitor was used to describe Martin and Mitchell. So again, just, this just was not a favorable. It, it, it is so different from the Snowden thing. It's just so different. Uh, and I'm, you know, my own views are pretty critical of, of Snowden. And it's a little, to me personally, I mean, I teach U.S. intelligence, but I also teach American politics and the presidency and you know, try to keep up with what's going on politically in our culture and society. And I was a little surprised at the extent of the favorable res response. I mean, I think, I guess I understand why, but anyway, it's, it's, it's just so different uh, today than 1960 in terms of response to what these young men did. Just, uh, just to make you aware, the last session that we had, there was a very lively discussion in here about Snowden. Right. Uh, it was quite interesting. So I think everybody's now resolved their thoughts and <laughs> decide where they where Well, they and I will out. admit that I've purposely not tried to say, like, I am so fascinated by the Snowden case, 
But I always, in presentations, I like to do presentations on things where I've done like real research, where I can say something that might be above and beyond what might otherwise be said. Snowden case I find absolutely fascinating, but I don't consider myself an authority on the Snowden case. All right, well, Dr. David Barrett, thank you very much for a stimulating presentation.